Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight um, on this uh, for this webinar on the links between the climate crisis and the debt crisis. Um, my name is Eva Watkinson. I'm the head of campaigns here at, at Debt Justice, um, and uh, yeah, we've got a, a kind of a really great panel, I think, to to try and unpack some of these issues for us. Um, but just before we get started, just a tiny, tiny bit of housekeeping. Um, so uh, my colleague Zach is also um, sort of beside, behind the scenes helping us out with uh, hi Zach um, with the Q and A. So just. Uh, we'll have a we'll have a sort of dedicated question and answer session at the end. But if you do have any questions um, throughout, then please just post them in the chat or the Q and A. Um, and also just to say that we're we're obviously sort of recording this. So if um, so, yeah, partly so that people who who couldn't make it tonight can uh, can hear it later on. But just uh, yeah, for everyone's information. Um, so yeah, so to get started, so. Um, Obviously, we all know that the COP27 conference started off this week. It is going to go on for two weeks until the 18th of November. Um, and uh, yeah, it's obviously really sort of crucial meeting for, for lots and lots of reasons. But one of the things that is on the table a little bit more this year, maybe than uh, in previous years, is uh, conversations around... Um, around kind of recompense around the loss and damage that has been caused by the climate crisis for lots of countries in the global south um and there's yeah there's quite a lot to say about all of this stuff and there's there's obviously it's kind of um you know top of mind for a lot of our allies in the global south because of all of the the kind of man-made crises that they're facing because of the climate crisis. Um, so we're going to have a look at both what's happening at the conference itself um, and uh, then I guess some of the wider issues around that, around kind of reparations, climate debt, um, those, those sorts of issues. Um, as I said, I'm really glad as well to be joined by our sort of brilliant panel. So we've got um, Tess Wolfenden, who is our sort of resident climate and debt expert at Debt Justice. Um, also joined by Tatiana Garavito, who's an organizer and facilitator um, and works, I think, at the moment for um, Tipping Point UK, sort of helping to build grassroots power uh, for, for climate justice. And we're also joined by Farouk Tariq, who's the General Secretary of Pakistan Kisan Rabita Committee, which is a network of 26 uh, peasant organizations and part of the, the Via Campesina platform um, who's joining us from Pakistan. So um, thank you very much for, for, for joining us tonight. Um, and I'm just going to sort of do a bit of brief chairing. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of hand over to each of the speakers in turn. And then, as I said, we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think I'll, I'll hand over to Tess, first of all. Thanks so much, Eva. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, awesome. Okay. So as Eva mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about the links between the debt and climate crisis and also touch a little bit on COP27, what is it, um, why do we care about it, and why are we going, basically. So that's what I'll be talking about. But I'm going to start by looking at the ways in which the debt and climate crisis intersect. So there's, there's four key, I mean, there's many key ways, but I'm going to talk about four of them to keep it relatively simple today. Um, so the first way that the debt and climate crisis intersect really is that high debt levels mean that there are less resources for climate action at a national level because vital resources are being drained out of the country through high debt levels, through high debt repayments, sorry. So there's currently 54 countries across the global south that are in debt crisis. And this is just at the moment, right? This is set to get worse with interest rates rising across the US. Um, with the impacts of the war of in Ukraine, and also, of course, the rising impacts of the climate crisis. And being in debt crisis basically means that countries across the global south are being forced to choose whether to fund public services and address vital, vital issues at a national level, like the climate crisis, or servicing their debt. 
last year, um, our stat with Tim at Debt Justice uh, created a statistic that shows that lower income countries are spending five times more on debt repayments than they are on addressing the climate crisis. So this really puts into stark numbers how much money debt repayments are draining out of countries every year. And of course, it's not just about the loss of resources at a national level, it's also about where this money is going. It's going into the pockets of wealthy lenders who could make massive profits from interest rates if they're repaid in full. So this kind of highlights the injustice that's embedded within the debt system. So the second link between the debt and climate crisis really actually looks at natural resource exploitation. So as a means to generate the resources to repay debts, some Global South governments turn to their natural resources um, as a form of finance, essentially, as a form of generating revenue. And when I say natural resources, that includes fossil fuels, which, of course, in turn negatively impacts the climate crisis once again. And this is not just something that national level governments are doing by their own accord. This is actually actively encouraged, if not forced upon some global South governments by powerful actors like the IMF, who continue to include fossil fuel extraction as a part of conditions of their loans. So, for example, at the moment in Argentina, the government um, with the IMF are pushing for fracking in the Vaca Muerta uh, region, um, despite significant pushback from indigenous and local communities there because of the environmental and human harms these projects are going to have. And this photo is actually a demonstration against fracking efforts in Vaca Muerta in Argentina. So the third connection I'm going to talk about is the lack of climate finance. So in essence, we know that it is the global north and wealthy governments and institutions and corporations that have caused the climate crisis. This is a well-established fact, and I think even most rich countries now admit this to some degree. Because of that, there is a general understanding that rich countries um, who have created the climate crisis and benefited from the harms they've caused to the climate owe a debt to vulnerable countries because of this destruction that vulnerable countries are experiencing the worst impacts of. This is actually enshrined in some of the kind of official climate agreements that are in place globally. And in 2009, um, wealthy governments promised to provide $100 billion worth of climate finance every year to vulnerable countries by 2020. Now, they've had a long time to deliver this finance, and yet they actually haven't. They've still not achieved the 100 billion per year goal, despite the fact that we're two years past the deadline. And actually, the, the, the promise of 100 billion ends in 2025. So we're only a few years off the end of that goal. Because of the lack of climate finance, Global South governments are basically forced to pay for the impacts of the climate crisis themselves. And the costs are astronomical, as we all know, they're absolutely enormous, which means that many governments have to rely on borrowing more money, adding to debt levels in order to, to cover the costs. And to add insult to injury, not only are they having to borrow more, but lenders are actually saying, oh wait, you're really vulnerable to the climate crisis, which means our loans to you are high risk. So we're actually gonna charge you higher interest rates for the honor of borrowing from us. So these extra interest rates because of the impacts of the climate crisis are thought to be costing vulnerable countries 168 billion extra dollars over the next 10 years, which is a huge sum of money on top of already the lack of climate finance and unsustainable debt levels. I think one of the key areas where this particular part of the link between debt and climate crisis plays out is within loss and damage. So before I move on to the fourth element or the fourth link, I should say, I'm going to talk a bit about loss and damage and what I mean by that. So loss and damage is kind of the technical term that's used to talk about the impacts of the climate crisis that can't be prevented or addressed is really talking about the devastation of the climate crisis. And it refers to kind of extreme events that happen in a moment, like a, like a tropical storm, but also slow onset impacts like rising sea levels. 
And of course, it also refers to economic impacts, so the financial costs of, of the destruction of the climate crisis, but also impacts that we can't put into monetary terms. So things like the loss of indigenous ways of being in the world and indigenous communities being moved off their land that you can't really monetize. So despite the fact that loss and damage is happening, it's here, it's getting way worse, as Farouk I'm sure will talk about in the context of Pakistan, for example, there is currently no official finance from wealthy countries to vulnerable countries to cover loss and damage. So if you think about what I've just said in terms of the fact that climate, the lack of climate finance means that vulnerable countries are forced to pay for the crisis themselves, in the context of loss and damage, vulnerable countries are forced to pay for the entire devastation of the climate crisis almost themselves. And of course, this adds such a huge layer of injustice because not only are vulnerable countries experiencing the impacts of the crisis they didn't create, but they're also having to pay for it. And then on top of that, not only are they having to pay for it, but they have to keep repaying existing debt because despite these enormous devastating events that are happening around the world, there is no mechanism to suspend and cancel debt when an extreme event happens. So countries are having to borrow more and keep paying their existing debts. So we did some calculations earlier this year, and this is just to highlight the point I was making about, about vulnerable countries having to pay for the climate crisis themselves. So without funding to help repair and recover from the climate crisis, sub-Saharan African countries will have to take on, on almost one trillion in debt over the next 10 years such a huge amount of money that doesn't even cover all countries that are vulnerable to the climate crisis. This is just sub-Saharan Africa. And also to, to kind of share a case study of what I mean by the impacts of loss and damage. So in um, 2015, um, Dominica was hit by Hurricane Erica. And then two years later in 2017 was hit by Hurricane Maria. Both caused huge devastation and destruction to this Caribbean island. Um, Maria especially destroyed 90% of the island's infrastructure and caused $2 billion worth of damage. And of course, that doesn't even factor in the non-economic damage caused by the hurricane that we can't really put into financial terms. So Dominica contributes very little to the climate crisis, such a, such a tiny amount, um, and yet it's experienced this huge destruction. And the lack of climate finance that the country received after the hurricane meant that the government had to rely heavily on loans to generate the resources to recover and reconstruct. So we see this almost immediately in the debt levels of the country. So in 2017, sorry, when the hurricane happened, debt was already high, it was 68% of GDP. But one year later, it was 10% higher at 78% of GDP. So there we can really see the stark, the stark growth in debt after an extreme climate event. And then on top of that, just a few days after Hurricane Maria happened, the government was actually due to make millions of pounds worth of debt repayments. And because there's no way of preventing that suspending or cancelling debt, they had to make that repayment or risk going into default and the consequences of that. So while the, the country urgently needed resources to, for the humanitarian response and to start reconstruction, they immediately actually had to put that money into the pockets of lenders. So the fourth link between the debt and the climate crisis that I want to talk about is actually the last one, um, looks at climate finance itself. So we've already established that there is a tiny inadequate amount of climate finance being provided to vulnerable countries. But what makes it worse is that 71% of this climate finance is provided in the form of loans. So not only does this add to debt burdens, um, which we've already established are very high, but it also means that actually it's vulnerable countries and themselves again that are being forced to pay for the impact of the climate crisis because they have to pay this money back and often with interest rates. So again, we're adding to the levels, the multiple levels of injustice embedded within the links between the debt, debt and climate crises, but also the kind of climate finance system itself. And this 71% actually is, is general. It's a general figure across um, all climate finance that's provided. 
for some regions and countries, it's actually high as high as 90% loans. Um, and actually, there are many countries that can't access any grants because they're considered too high income. Um, so we're only able to access loans. So what do we think we should do about it? What are our demands? So on this slide, this is really outlining the demands of the global debt movement on how to address the interlinking debt and climate crises. And these are demands we're going to be taking to COP27. And I think they'll probably sound very familiar to a lot of you. But first things first, we need to cancel debt. Now, we don't need to just cancel debt for the climate crisis. We need to cancel it for health and education, etc. But climate is one of the, the kind of core tenants of, of why we need debt cancellation. So we can free up resources for governments to invest in key issues as defined by them and the people within those countries. We also need to put in place a mechanism to cancel and suspend debt when a climate extreme event takes place so that countries are really able to prioritize the recovery and reconstruction from an extreme event rather than passing over profit to lenders essentially. We also need wealthy countries to basically pay their climate debt. We need them to start paying up um, for the damage and destruction they've caused to our planet and people. So this means providing adequate grant-based climate finance. And this needs to be understood as a form of compensation for the destruction they've caused. It's not charity, it's not support, it's not generosity. It's a matter of justice and correcting a wrong. And that's a message that sometimes gets a bit lost, I think, in some of the kind of technical climate spaces. Now, I'm going to go into a bit more detail in the next slide around what some of the kind of technical elements of, of this demand are. But essentially, from a top line perspective, what we really want is a new climate finance goal post 2025 that isn't 100 billion, that is trillions, because that's the kind of money we need to be addressing the climate crisis. And we also need to see a loss and damage finance facility established. Now this, basically, as it says on the tin, will be a mechanism, a, a fund or facility where wealthy governments provide money directly to countries impacted by the climate crisis so that they're no longer responsible for paying for the impacts of climate crisis themselves. And the last demand is, is really about making sure that all countries can access grant-based climate finance. So rather than judging whether a country needs access to um, grant-based finance through their income status, whether they're high or middle income or low income. Instead, we should introduce a index which looks at a country holistically, which looks at what are the impacts of the climate crisis, what are levels of inequality, um, what other issues are facing this country in order to de determine which countries can access grant-based climate finance. So I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit about COP um, and what it's all about. So COP basically just stands for Conference of the Parties. It's just a techie acronym for people meeting, basically. But COP, the COPs have been a UN process since 1995, and they are basically where governments and negotiators come together um, to decide how to address and prevent the climate crisis, how to keep our temperatures below 1.5 to avert the worst impacts. Now, because it's a UN process, Global South um, governments do have more of a voice at COP than they do in other kind of global institutions like the IMF, for example. But wealthy governments um, do still block and water down demands, and it is a challenging space to navigate. So it's imperfect, but it's what exists. So it's why it's why we see it as still an important space to engage and um, advocate for change within. And of course, activists and civil society and organizers can also go and influence the outcome. So what can we expect at this COP? So I've broken this down to within the negotiations, which is where it's a little bit more techy, and then outside the negotiations. So first things first, we can't achieve debt cancellation at COP. 
that happens within the G20, the IMF and World Bank. So that's not really what we're hoping to achieve within this COP. Our focus within the kind of technical space at, at COP is really on ensuring that climate finance or the lack of it um, doesn't add to debt levels. Now, there are two key processes where we can try and engage and encourage people to, to adopt this kind of position. So firstly, there are huge efforts this year across civil society and global South governments to make sure that this loss and damage finance facility that I mentioned earlier is established this year. Rich countries have already tried to wiggle their way out of this by introducing text saying something along the lines of, we will make sure this conversation has a result by the end of 2024. So they're basically saying, let's just delay, let's put this off as long as we possibly can. But there is huge civil society and activist efforts to make sure that this year we get the finance facility established. And this, these efforts build on decades of work to try and establish this facility at COP. Um, so we're, we're putting our efforts behind making sure that happens this year. The other kind of techie process is what I mentioned before is around this new climate finance goal post 2025. So this is where we're going to be pushing for the trillions and it's where we're going to be pushing for grant based climate finance rather than loans, again alongside global South governments. But outside of the negotiations is where things are a little bit more exciting. Um, so what we might expect to see this year is Global South leaders highlighting the importance of addressing debt in relation to climate. So we've already seen the Prime Minister of Pakistan, South Africa and Barbados making interventions, um, highlighting the importance of addressing debt here. Um, and of course, highlighting the importance of grant based climate finance. We we're already seeing a lot of media coverage um, of the links between debt and climate finance, which is growing from last year, which is really encouraging. And we're also expecting to see actions and demos by activists and civil society raising awareness on the links between debt and climate. Now, this isn't going to be to the same level as we saw at Glasgow last year because we're in Egypt and the government um, is cracking down, is being very kind of strict on a lot of this stuff and there's a huge amount of surveillance so what we see is likely to be smaller um, and within kind of the official cop zones rather than outside but those messages are still really important to be getting out and lastly i wanted to just share quickly why we're going to cop why we see it as an important space for us so I mean, I've said this like a hundred times already, but the main thing that we really need to be doing is to raise awareness of debt in relation to climate in solidarity with the global debt movement and our global South allies. Now, I think we see this in two key ways. The first is, as we've established really, that addressing debt is vital if we want to achieve climate justice. Literally, we will not be able to achieve climate justice unless we address the debt crisis. So we see it as really important to influence the outcomes of COP and ensure that debt is factored in so that we can have um, better climate outcomes, essentially. But the other side of this is more about encouraging more voices and encouraging more noise around the links between debt and climate and encouraging more people to care about debt and recognise it as a key issue that's absolutely vital to achieving climate, but also economic and social justice. So the more noise we can make at COP, the more noise we can make about the importance of debt, the more power and the more energy we can put into achieving the demands of the global debt movement. And so that's why you're going to see a lot of um, social media messaging and a lot of messaging from us around the importance of debt and climate over the next few weeks. But I'll stop there and thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the other presentations too. Thanks so much, much, Tess. That was really great. That was a really great uh, summary of some of the key issues and what's happening at the international level. Um, but yeah, just to say there's a couple of questions that have come through already, uh, which I think I'll, I'll give you a chance to catch your breath. 
and um, we'll maybe come back to those in, in the Q&A uh, a little bit later on. Yeah, I've just seen a, a comment from Timothy that says superb introduction, which I would definitely agree with. Um, so I think, but I think now we're going to go to Farouk next, um, who's going to tell us a bit more about what's been happening in Pakistan, which has obviously been hit by massive floods recently. And I think about 33 million people have been affected by those floods. Um, so yeah, it'd be, it'd be looking forward really to hearing hearing what your organisation has been doing and, and what you want the, the global community and activists in the UK to be doing in solidarity. So um, yeah, I'll, ha I'll hand over to you now, Farouk. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Tess. Uh, you have laid down a very good basis of depth and climate uh, justice, really building the linkages of the both. And they both are very much linked. And we are experiencing firsthand this issue that until you deal the question of debt cancellation, you cannot have the uh, climate justice. Now, I would uh, uh, like to start that Pakistani Prime Minister who spoke today at COP27, for the first time, he said, we don't want to, to be in debt trap. So we had never heard from our political leaders about climate justice, about debt trap. They were always after IMF, uh, fulfilling conditionalities, never spoke about any trap or any justice. And I was happy to see the foreign minister of Pakistan, the prime minister of Pakistan, most of the ministers and opposition leaders are now taking up this issue of climate justice and also debt cancellation. They are also talking about reparations, but we have to see uh, if the reparation is made, how that is going to be spent in Pakistan, because we have a history of uh, of uh, very misadministration of the funds that the Pakistani uh, politicians, particularly the rich politicians, receive uh, from um, different institutions. Now, we have been raising the issue of uh, debt cancellation since 2005, when there was an earthquake in Pakistan. And that was uh, uh, October 2005, over 100,000 people lost their lives uh, in one of the worst uh, uh, earthquake in the history of mankind. And uh, uh, then um, even uh, we raised the issue, we had a campaign in Pakistan that don't pay uh, the foreign debt, just uh, stop paying uh, foreign debt and uh, spend that uh, money on the rehabilitation uh, and immediate relief to the victims of this earthquake. But unfortunately, at the time, it was General Musharraf who was in power and uh, they continued to pay the debt and they never ever heard the voices from uh, our uh, civil society activists and so on. Then we raised this issue in 2010 and 2012 when there was uh, also devastating rains across Pakistan and floods. And uh, at that time, it was mainly the floods, not the rains, uh, that uh, made uh, the lives of many millions uh, havoc. Uh, and we also raised, uh, we had rallies in Lahore and other parts of Pakistan that uh, the government must say no to payment of the foreign debt, at least some relief. And this is the time you all world is looking at you and you should say we don't have any money. We have to spend on this on the on the rehabilitation of our people. But that was not done. Then it happened during Corona times uh, in 2020 uh, when um, it was again the same situation. And uh, our former prime minister Imran Khan, he paid 25% more loans than the previous year. So th they did not consider the devastating effect of these man-made uh, disasters. Um, and they continue to pay the debt. So is the condition at today in Pakistan as well, uh, where the government is paying back. And one of the worst element of the present situation is that the present government, which came into power six months before, a conservative government, 
of uh, of Shahba Sharif, who is in uh, Cairo. I would be there tomorrow as well. I'm flying there as well to raise voices as Tess said that there is a need to make noise. So we will make a lot of noise uh, at the venue. Uh, though Shahba Sharif government has fulfilled all conditionalities of IMF to get the last part of the loan they negotiated in 2019 when Imran Khan was in power. And what, what were the conditionalities? Raise the price of the electricity, double the price of electricity. We never had that expensive electricity, which is now at present time. Raise the price of oil, raise the price of gas, reduce the price of rupees, and then but they said you will have more export and less imports. It happened. Uh, it didn't happen because Pakistan is not an industrialized country or anything to sell in the international market, apart from religious fanaticism, which uh, the fanatic groups are exporting all the time, where we are fighting also. One of the main challenges we are facing is also religious fundamentalism, who gave a religious cover to these disasters. It's God's will. What can you do? Is is you, you can't do anything. So when Corona came, these mullahs started uh, giving azans in the mosques at ten thirty in the evening, in the night, that this will uh, um, um, push back uh, the Corona attacks and so on. So that sort of uh, situation we have faced, and the present government has paid the the remaining part of the debt and still they have to pay 22 billion dollars during this financial year and pakistan total debt has gone over 130 the foreign debt uh, altogether 130 billions and the total debt has crossed nearly 70 percent of the gdp at present time it's a devastating situation I have never seen in my political life of 50 years the impact, the bad impact these rains and floods had in Pakistan. Although I am based in Lahore, but we see the situation in Sindh, in Balochistan, in Khyber Pukhtunkhwa, and also in Gilgit Baltistan. So the two things came together. The heat wave started in March this year. It normally starting in May or June. Whenever we had a May Day rally, it, is, it was very good season. But last two, three years, four years, it has completely changed the weather uh, pattern in Pakistan. And we see that the heat wave which started in March this year still continue. We are still using fans to sleep at night not uh, uh, the the blankets uh, as was the case uh, when we used to start taking blankets at night in uh, september in october in november in summer january and february but that is gone the weather pattern has changed because of this climate impact the climate change impact on pakistan it has the receiving end one of the 10 countries which has the most affected by climate uh, changes <clears throat> during the past years. We have been talking about this. This can happen, this can happen, this can happen. It has happened in Pakistan. One third of Pakistan was underwater at one time. Almost 3.3, uh, uh, 33 million people were affected. $40 billion lost to the uh, to the over 4,000 kilometer of uh, railway line has been destroyed. Most of the roads are gone. 34 districts out of 36 districts in Balochistan were uh, affected not by floods, but by consistent rains, seven continuous days, day and night rain. And there is no infrastructure dealing with such uh, 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 such uh, rains, uh, and that meant that uh, the water really took over all the land. It has a massive damage to the crops in Pakistan, to the uh, fruit gardens, all the banana gardens, all the apple garden, all the grape garden in Balochistan and Sindh are gone. Most of the fish farms, 
is been destroyed because water just took over everything it looked like that the arabian sea has spread all over so uh, there was uh, a video made from from a, a helicopter and it was miles and miles and miles of water in different parts of sind i heard the news at 9 today that in several districts of sind water is still there and people are on the road almost half of those who left their home are still on the roads at present time and here we have an opposition uh, leader like imran khan who want a regime change who is having public rallies he was uh, unfortunately attacked by a fanatic uh, because he has been using religion very much and uh, that's uh, where when you play with fire you are also victim of fire so he has been um, proposing uh, negotiation with taliban accept taliban's government in afghanistan that was his demand and you can't talk to these uh, um, uh, these extremists they are against uh, education of girls they are against all sort of social um, uh, justice uh, issues so uh, but now the opposition is not caring the government is talking but not doing much uh the relief effort has been done by the people of pakistan i have seen a great wave of sympathy we were on the roads on 27th of july we put up the first relief camp on main mall road of lahore when the rain started in baluchistan i was there i am now 67 year old i was with a bucket whenever a, a car would stop on the red light we will go knock the door please give some money for the uh, flood affected for the rain affected of baluchistan and we saw women gave the best the the families who were traveling they gave all the money but those in the big cars they just looked at us said uh, we are beggars uh, we are not activist so they would give a little bit but wherever we saw families we see ordinary people we saw people on drive on motorbike on cycles on rickshaws on buses they would call us to give us money and we collected over 5 million rupees from the road of lahore to start the first food rationing in baluchistan and so we have done some work uh, uh, which was needed at the time and we also uh, not only provided relief but also raised issue of debt cancellation of reparation and we also talked reparation for whom is it for the corrupt ruling classes or is it for the people of pakistan we have to link it very clearly but we when we talk about uh, reparation we just don't demand from the states we also demand from the multinational corporations who are who have enriched like anything they take they have taken over the world so it's not just this it's not just north and south anymore we have to see the changes that has taken place in the past period and we have to see the climate change impact in north as well so we have to build the people solidarity among north people and south people it's a people to people um, solidarity that we are talking about rather than state to state and mainly uh, on class base on the working class uh, working people must uh, link itself and we see that uh, lavia campesina raised funds for us we see war on want raised funds for us we see global justice now raised fund for us and we see the british uh, uh, people uh, coming forward and i i got a mail from a friend in bradford uh, who said i have sent a lot of warm clothes to you by ship it will reach in few days now so we see collections of pakistan community in britain sending uh, amounts and goods uh, to pakistan and so was the case also in pakistan and i would uh, end here i agree with uh, tess what you have been uh, saying about it but i don't have much hope although i'm going there raise with i don't have much hope of this cop 27 this is mostly talks and talks 
no implementation, no collection of fund. They have never fulfilled their promises. Whatever promises the states has done to Pakistan, even at this time, the most affected country of the world by climate justice, not because of our own fault, fault of European Union, fault of America, American imperialism, and fault of China. All the, the uh, whatever they have made uh, the global warming, we are paying the price for that. And we see even those promises, only maybe 20% of the promises has been fulfilled till now. So I see this uh, COP27 as continuation of COP26, talk and talk, greenwash, green capitalism and repression. And this is happening as you rightly mentioned Tess, happening in Egypt, where there's a dictatorship. And we have seen the repression in the past. I will go there. I have been kicked out of Indonesia at one time because I raised the issue over there. I will raise the issue of dictatorship. I have been arrested several times in Pakistan fighting against dictatorship. We will never accept a multi-dictator telling us what to do and so on. So we will raise our voices with the Egyptian people's struggle for democracy and also struggle for climate justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really powerful and um, yeah, a lot there to, to think about and to kind of get our teeth into. Um, uh, yeah, just a reminder that any questions you've got, if you could put them in the Q&A or the chat, that would be great. Um, and then we'll, we'll just come to them at the end. So I'm just going to hand over to our last speaker, Tatiana, now, um, who I think is also going to speak about how, um, about sort of debt and reparations, but also how we can get involved in, in mobilising and campaigning around some of these issues uh, on the 12th of November, with there are big sort of marches coming up across the UK. So I'll just hand over to you now, Tatiana. Thank you so much, Eva. And hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me here to speak. Um, and I think like others here have done, um, I like to maybe start by acknowledging that, you know, the so-called debt that countries from the global south face at the moment is the direct result of colonialism and the ongoing extraction and plunder and exploitation of people, resources um, from you know, places in the global south um, and that debt and, you know, the on top of the already, you know, very violent destruction of colonization itself has have created the conditions that we find, um, social and material condition, conditions that we find ourselves in uh, that come together in the form of uh, the climate crisis. And, you know, Tess, thank you so, so much for, um, you know, for framing that so well in your presentation and also for, uh, for telling us about what's going on on the ground in many, in, 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 in those places. Um, but today, so I wanted to talk about uh, climate reparations, um, trying to bring a debt uh, justice perspective, as I think, you know, um, this doesn't get a lot of attention, the idea of reparations uh, in political debates or even within movements. And when it does, it's like today, um, you know, we hear from Tory uh, MPs here in the UK denouncing uh, the idea of climate reparations after Britain's Prime Minister uh, Sunak pledge, I think 1.5 billion pounds uh, by 2025 uh, to adaptation, uh, which is of course great, uh, but I think as you know, you were saying this, uh, not enough for the fifth largest polluter of fossil fuels. Um, but of course it was enough for the Tory government and the right wing uh, media here in the UK to make a massive fuss about or against climate reparations. Um, so I guess, you know, um, also just bring in uh, some of the stuff, the figures that you shared, Tess, in relation to this like pledge that uh, that was made by Sunak today. Um, and to put things into perspective, you know, some of the researchers, um, you know, working on, on, uh, on climate uh, reparations or loss and damage estimate that um, by 
2030, the cost of loss and damage in the global south will be something between 290 uh, and 580 billion uh, US dollars annually. And that by 2050, the cost will rise to something like two, one or two trillion dollars each year. Um, and of course, as you know, some uh, you, you have heard already, this this cost is already paid uh, by those uh, at the receiving end of this, those who are who are losing their homes, those who are losing their crops and their livelihoods. So of course, the pledges of Sunak today and Britain were not going are not going to be enough. Um, so, you know, the reason why I wanted to talk about climate reparations today is uh, because although I think uh, loss and damage is uh, essential and key in, um, you know, in sort of like addressing the climate crisis and also, you know, uh, bringing the, uh, the, 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 the ideas and the, the demands and calls for, uh, for debt justice, I don't think that will be enough. Uh, because I think that we need a broader system of transformation that seeks to repair uh, you, you know, the, the harms of centuries of exploitation, climate denial and delay that go, you know, um, I think beyond uh, uh, what we can imagine. Uh, of course, that justice is part of it. Of course, loss and damage is part of it. But I guess the invitation for me today is from me today is for us to think about, you know, not just um, you know, finance, but to really, really think about the kinds of systems and the logics of the systems that we have that need to be transformed in order for this not to happen again. Um, and, you know, as I'm saying this, I, of course, like, you know, have in mind, um, uh, you know, the pledges of uh, the biggest polluted polluting countries uh, in the world for you know as uh, some of you suggested that uh, recently said that you know we needed that they were going to pledge 100 billion US dollars of climate finance to countries in the global so south and this has not happened at all um and instead what we saw was you know and have been seen is like uh, you know uh, finances being delivered uh, in the form of loans, in the form of development aid, and sometimes even double counted. Um, and this is, of course, the same for debt. Um, I think in Latin America, where I come from, uh, there's something like 81% of climate finance that is received that are that goes in the form of loans, uh, even for adaptation, which is like, you know, like really not helpful for uh, for some of the you know contexts in which the Latin American uh, countries are having to uh, to to work with. An example of this is you know recently um, the newly elected president of Colombia, um, my home country, Gustavo Petro, proposing to the biggest polluters um, uh, countries in the UN an exchange uh, between, you know, um, eternal debt for um, for internal expenses to save and recover our jungles and our forests and our wetlands. Uh, this is because, you know, in 2022, last year, we experienced the highest fiscal deficit in uh, that we've had in recent years. Uh, and its external debt uh, accounted for half of the country's Colombia's uh, GDP. So, you know, this is the context in which uh, Latin American countries, Global South countries um, are having to operate. Uh, and of course, it's only normal that, you know, that countries in the Global South are, uh, are demanding, you know, loss and damage, uh, finance for loss and damage. Um, uh, yeah, and sort of like calling out the fact that the, there isn't a dedicated stream of climate finance uh, for 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 some of the you know violence and and uh, and disasters that we are having to experience, um, and yeah, so um, I guess like you know you've heard from us um, quite a lot about you know the context in which we're operating, um, and 
you know, how and when climate reparations comes up in this conversation is, I think for me, when we start to think about, so, you know, what would it mean to live in a world where we worked uh, to meaningfully repair the harm that we have caused to others. Um, so, you know, this is kind of like the center, uh, this, the central question in, um, in our work around climate reparations. Um, and, you know, looking at the UN, for instance, as, you know, this institution that holds so much power and where like, you know, uh, you know, countries around the world are going to meet uh, to talk about these things. Even the UN has already um, come up with a definition for reparations um, that is quite specific, actually. Um, so, you know, in the past, they've talked about um, five conditions to be met for full re uh, reparations. Um, they talked about uh, cessation, assurance, and assurances and guarantees of non-repetition. This is something that the fossil fuel uh, industry should really, really, you know, hear and, and follow. So this simply means uh, stopping um, doing the harm and don't, and, you know, and, and making sure that it doesn't happen again, uh, which is, you know, a very simple pr principle, but really not followed by uh, none of the very toxic and violent industries that uh, we that operate under, under the capitalist system in which we live. Uh, but the UN also, you know, has another principle around uh, or condition for, for reparations around uh, restitution and repatriation. So, you know, this idea of returning things back to the, the way they, they were previously, of course, this doesn't work for a lot of communities that don't want uh, to go back to, you know, um, to how they were before or to, um, you know, be sort of, you know, um, or that where the context is, is kind of different. But, you know, I think it is important to remember that, you know, that uh, uh, to or to remember this when we're talking about the harm that some of these industries, for instance, for instance, have created. Um, another principle that the UN uh, also talks about is compensation. And I think loss and damage goes uh, under, under this. So it's paying for the damages suffered and caused uh, by violent uh, and, uh, um, you know, corporations uh, or states or wars. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very, very important one, of course, as well. The UN also talks about another principle and called satisfaction, which, you know, talks about apologizing and listening to the needs of people that have been harmed in spaces like the COPs or like these big international arenas. You know, those will be the really, you know, the 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 natural spaces for for some of this to happen but we never see communities uh you know on the ground fighting climate crisis the climate crisis for instance really being heard uh, and being listened about you know the the solutions that that they need um for in order to address uh, uh address climate uh, disaster and the last thing that they talk about is rehabilitation that's you know an example of this i guess is providing uh, support services for uh, people who have been affected. So I wanted to bring in this, um, this definition and these five principles from the UN because this already exists. Um, but at present, of course, you know, we have uh, UK and other uh, very wealthy governments uh, that are not you know, particularly interested in, in, in uh, providing climate reparations, even though you know, as others have uh, suggested, they agree uh, with the violence and the harm that they have caused in the past, but they're just simply not interested uh, in uh, in providing climate reparations to those communities. Uh, and as Farouk mentioned, um, the conversations that will need to happen in order for this to make sure that it doesn't go to the elites uh, of uh, countries in the global south, but really that uh, to make sure that, you know, that this involves a redistribution of power and resources to those communities where that power and resources have been taken from. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, I guess. <laughs> this is uh, my point, the point that I wanted to, to make. Um, some, some of us campaigning uh, here in 
well, in the UK, uh, in solidarity with communities in uh, from the global south, have been making serious demands around this. Um, and you know, I want to mention some of these to make this idea of uh, of climate reparations really practical because you know it sometimes can can seem as like you know. Um, something quite abstract, but there are very, you know, uh, practical things that um, uh, that we can be demanding and calling for, and also socializing within our movements. I think, you know, uh, as Farouk was saying, like um, it is important that you know the people, workers around the world, unite around these these demands for reparations, unite around these demands uh, for debt cancellation, because it is, you know, it is. The only solution that we have at the moment, but you know, some of the the demands that that uh, organizations in the coalition have been talking about are, you know, stopping uh, fossil fuel projects, of course, uh, or stopping uh, stopping giving public money to polluting industries that happened during the pandemic, um, you know, uh, and continues to happen uh, uh, on and on. Uh, stopping hostile migration policies, for instance, um, and and many more that I'm going to put in the chat in a moment. But also, we've been thinking about what are some of the things that we we need to 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 start, um, and some of the things that you know, climate reparations, a, cl a reparative justice framework help us to think about is, you know, the fact that we need to start making polluters like coal, oil, and gas companies pay for climate reparations, the fact that we need to invest in good green jobs in a just transition, and we really need to think about what it, what that means. Uh, I'm looking at, you know, the, um, the Colombian context at, at the moment, uh, where we are having to really think about, you know, what a just transition looks like uh, with all of the different kind of like regional and international uh, challenges that that that, that uh, brings. Uh, but thinking about what are some of the things that we need to start as well, you know, also reversing cuts to overseas aid and promote debt relief and of course debt cancellation and that's work that the debt uh, justice campaign is, has been doing in the UK but also uh, with movements around the world. And of course, giving decision making power to communities on the front lines of health, of climate, economic, and social injustice. Uh, and that's like, you know, the process of making movements, the process of having conversations amongst ourselves so that we can really, really, you know, understand what reparations mean uh, for us and build the, our collective power to make sure that those conversations happen at all uh, levels. Um, so yeah, those are just some of the practical ways in which the groups and organizations in the network, as I said, have begun to understood and work on climate reparations. But I guess the invitation that I wanted to make to you is for you all to think about what climate reparations mean for your context, for your campaigns, for your communities. Um, I know that I imagine that a lot of you are working on various different topics, but I, I think it is important that we start looking at the work that needs to happen in a more systemic way and also to start thinking about the worlds uh, and systems that we want to create instead that hopefully are based on, 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 on care and repair. Uh, and just finally, I just wanted to share with you that um, as Eva was saying earlier, we, our comrades in Egypt are not able to mobilize around the COP uh, this year, and they have sent um, a, 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 an invitation to all of us around the world to uh, to come out on the 12th of November uh, in a day of uh, glo a global day of action, uh, which we have uh, responded to, and we're organizing uh, a big, well, not just one, big mobilizations here in the in the UK. In London, we're going to have um, a mobilization starting at uh, 10 o'clock uh, on Saturday. And we're going to start with a vigil for Chris Cava, a black man who was killed by the police a couple of months ago. And then all of us will join um, the climate reparations block that is going to be leading the demonstration uh, for the second year um, here in London. So this is really, really an invitation for all of you who are in London to join us uh, for, you know, in the climate uh, reparations uh, block. And if you're not in London, there are various different actions happening across the UK that you will be able uh, to join. Um, and yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, we can 
uh, continue to work on these topics to really, really make sure, as I said at the beginning, that we're working towards a broader system of transformation that can seek, you know, the repair um, of the harm caused by centuries uh, centuries of colonial exploitation, including the cancellation of uh, of debt uh, for good. So I hope to see you all maybe on the on Saturday, the twelfth of November. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Thank you so much. That was that was brilliant. Um, it's a really great. Um, I guess looking at that whole deep injustice of the whole system, but then also maybe giving us a little glimmer of hope uh, for what a kind of a better system could look like. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll come back to to kind of some of those themes in the Q and A. And so, yeah, I think just um, just sort of moving now in, we've got a little bit of time for questions. So, do you have a think? Uh, and if you've got anything else, do post them in the chat. Um, I'm just going to turn now to maybe some of the questions that we had earlier in the session, looking looking at debt itself. Um, uh, look, yeah, looking at debt, um, and uh, just maybe group together some of those questions uh, about how debt works and who pays and and some of those structures. So. Um, we had a question around um, kind of the amount of money that goes in aid flows um, from, uh, yeah, to, to um, Global South countries and how does that compare to levels of debt? Um, but also maybe I think, Tess, I'm going to throw some of these to you. Um, then a little bit of a look around kind of um, uh, maybe who some of those lenders are, so private lenders. And we had a question about whether uh, if the bulk of that debt was from private lenders, um, then uh, yeah, how, how does that work with that wider system? Are they are countries not eligible for new, new loans? Um, and I think probably you can link that to that to a question around kind of which of those loans are, are concessional. Um, not very many, I guess is the answer, but <laughs> none. But like, but yeah, I think if you can maybe group group those together and just say a little bit about how that that sort of debt system actually really works. Yeah, no problem. And thanks for the great questions. Um, I'll start with the question around financial flows to and from the global south. Um, so the question was really around, yeah, can we compare financial flows into the global south versus out of the global south? I don't have exact numbers. I just had a little dig around now. Um, but one thing I can say in terms of just comparing climate finance with debt servicing is that climate finance, the most recent numbers suggest that around 80 billion of climate finance is provided per year, roughly, that includes loans. So it could be as low as kind of 20 billion if we really look at just the grant-based climate finance. But last year, debt servicing for gl the Global South together was 390 billion. So the numbers are really, really stark, massive differences. I think also, um, linking to what Tati's talked about really in terms of how debt and the climate crisis are both a legacy of colonization and um, how debt and the climate crisis keep those colonial power relations alive today. I mean, one of the, the statistics or numbers we've got in, in another project we're using is that since 1970 to 2022, um, Global South governments have paid 2.5 trillion in interest payments to the Global North. So this isn't even really repaying debt. This is this is the the, the interest rates. This is the, this is the charge for the privilege of borrowing. So this is literally money plundered from the global south into the pockets of the global north. So the the the, the, the kind of myth or the narrative around the fact that global north is supporting the global south through aid or climate finance, etc., is actually needs to be flipped on its head. It's really the global south that is financially popping up and supporting the global north through the kind of continuation of colonial power relations. Then there was the question around which loans are concessional. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. As Eva said, it's not many. Um, and I would take this opportunity to say that any climate finance provided as loans, even concessional, are still deeply unjust. Because again, it's still, it's still putting the cost of the climate crisis back on to vulnerable countries who are most impacted. Um, which I know wasn't your question, but I just thought I'd take the opportunity to reiterate the point. Um, and the final question was around 
private debt and the ways in which global south countries might be seen as trapped in having to repay this debt to private creditors and i guess from our perspective what we would say is that debt relief any mechanism or, or system that's in place for debt cancellation absolutely must include private creditors um, as an absolute fundamental and this is really because around a third of global south debt is owed to private creditors so it's really important that they participate but they actually charge the highest interest rates. They, they plunder the most money from the global south because of those high interest rates. And so, and, and sorry, they do this because they, they're able to send it, they're able to say it's risky to lend to you. So we have to charge high interest rates to cover our risk. But the reality is they're lending to countries knowing that the risks of repayment are of not being able to repay are high because of how much debt there is. So it's only fair that private creditors take a hit when a country can't repay their debt. It's, it's fair that they're not repaid. And actually, evidence shows that when a country does have part of their debt cancelled, including their private debt, they are able to access private markets again much quicker than if they don't, if they don't cancel or, or get some debt relief. So the narrative that countries are trapped is really a very clever powerful narrative often put out by the private sector themselves to avoid having to give any debt cancellation or debt relief now that's not to say it's not right that global south governments take that position i think as civil society we're free often to say the kind of blunt key message exactly what needs to be said and some governments aren't in such a free position which is why it's so important for I think civil society and activists to kind of make these bold statements against powerful actors like the private sector. Great thank you very much Tess. Um, yeah Farika Tatiana did you have anything you wanted to add just on that that topic of I guess how, how debt is structured and who pays across the world? Oh, I think you might need to unmute. I will just give the example of bonded labor in Pakistan. We have a bonded labor issue in Pakistan, and particularly at the brick kilns, at the textile factories, and so on, where a large amount has been paid to a worker, and then expect that the worker would not leave that place. So it's like a slave labor. They, uh, that practice was going on. And in 88, the Supreme Court of Pakistan uh, abolished this bonded labor in, in, in the law and there was a bonded labor abolition act. It has never been implemented, although there is a, a very good law that there is no, there should be no bonded labor. So I see this, uh, I could extend this to the country. So if we have bonded countries, we have bonded labor and we have bonded countries who, whatever they do, they are really in the shackle of the advanced countries, whatever they pay, or they don't pay, or small pay, or big pay, they are like they are treated like slaves. They have been told how their economy should be run, how they should implement the new liberal agenda, how they should privatize, and they should uh, sell their uh, profitable industries, and let the market uh, determine uh, how the economy would be running. So that sort of conditions which make the life of ordinary people miserable. And, it, and this sort of conditionally make the rich more rich and poor more poor. And we have seen the growing inequalities, particularly in the past few years when our uh, foreign loan and the local loans has gone to a new height. Uh, it was never the case earlier. More the debt Pakistan takes, more inequality takes place in Pakistan. And now this uh, climate disaster, which has uh, on the top of that. So uh, altogether, it, there is only one way. Pakistan should refuse to pay and the international institution should stop taking back the loans they have given, they should just suspend. It should be just abolished. Uh, we cannot pay anyhow. Uh, that is another thing. Uh, there is no money to be paid. The only money that is to be paid is 
the money that should be spent on education on health on residence and on clean water and on sanitation that money has been paid to the uh, these financial institutions like imf world bank and we have now this cpac uh, uh, from china and um, uh, most of the new loans has come from china so china is also behaving uh, in a way the way imf has behaved although not that brutally and putting publicly some conditions but in fact it is almost the same impact which pakistan would have to build infrastructure with chinese money meant next few years we will be more slave to china than americans and imf so that's where our campaign is abolish the debt we can't pay and debt and climate uh, justice has very close links we cannot separate the both both has to go together and the only way is really i would uh, lastly say the building of solidarities solidarity is among the people and that's the way we feel strength that there is a way out where people takes the streets in thousands we are also having demonstration in pakistan on 12th of november we have done that we are building a climate justice movement in pakistan for four years earlier we had the first climate justice rally attended by mainly school students we told them about the example of this young girl from sweden if she can do it greta can do it why can't you do it so they came in the streets and we have few thousand participating in the first ever climate justice rally in lahore and that is been repeated every year and we had uh, a climate justice rally just now on 30th of september and one more peasant rally in sindh is been planned on 27th of november where the government has decided to give compensation to those who have some sort of papers to prove the ownership of the land but most of the peasantry is landless peasantry they have no papers they are without papers but they are working on the land they are in the living in the villages so we are demanding that they should be paid same compensation as those who have a piece of land and this is uh, our first major rally hope to be tended by thousands all these haris they are known haris those landless peasantry in sindh which is in the shackle of feudalism so our rally against feudalism would have would be would take place on 27th of november so i would also appeal to all of you and i was so happy to see the number of this meeting normally zoom meetings people are tired you know they don't come to zoom meetings anymore but i was happy to see over 100 in this uh, meeting at one point so really see the interest and build the people solidarity that's what i would say thank you great thank you very much <laughs> um that's a good note to end on um so i think um yeah we maybe just do a couple more questions uh, and tatiana i'm going to i'm going to throw this one to you if that's all right um mm -hmm. it's sort of one that we had on um uh sort of complete systems change uh so why don't we just get a new system where um we aren't tied to the american dollar and it's more based on re redistribution and completely revolutionize the monetary and financial system um prohibit usury so i don't know if you would like to comment on that systemic change of the global financial and monetary system i yeah i'm up for it <laughs> <laughs> for i think it. that's kind of like you know um that's the kind of work that we need to be doing as organizations communities campaigning organization organizations and groups everywhere like really thinking about what are the um what are the new logics that we want for the systems that we need to be able to uh, relate to uh, each other and the world around us in a way that uh, is nurturing that is caring that is loving and uh, i think you know of course we have to campaign and build our collective power against the big multinationals and the big polluters but i think we also need to create a bit of a space to thinking about okay so what are what are some of the things that we uh, can can start to do and what is that system that we really need to to do and i think you know many organizations and groups are doing it we also have uh indigenous communities around the world that have been showing us the way and have been telling us you know like 
I always laugh because, um, you know, um, a lot of uh, people now are saying that this, the science is, it's clear and the science is clear. They've, you know, they've talked about like the big challenges that we have as, uh, as communities, as societies around the world, but also indigenous communities have been telling us for a long, long time and we haven't uh, listened. So, you know, how can we, you know, sort of like listen to those people that have been able to live in a balanced way um, uh, throughout, you know, uh, you know, centuries and that, you know, and that have so much knowledge and wisdom for us to be able to learn. So I, yeah, all I can say is that I'm really, really up for it. Um, and also like, I think the you know, the campaign, some of the campaigns uh, that I mentioned before and the demands are actually doing that as well, you know, uh, as well as thinking about those logics, also thinking about, you know, if we take away all of these, you know, debt, and if we take uh, away, if, uh, you know, the, stop kind of like paying uh, fossil fuel industries, we will be able to start creating that world, that system in which we can be looked after and, uh, and, and yeah, and, and nurture. So yeah, I am very glad to hear that people here are up for the conversation. <laughs> Great, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, and just we've just got a tiny bit of time left, so I'm just going to um, join together maybe a couple of more of the questions we've got in the chat um, quickly. So um, maybe we had one just that was about uh, the uh, COP itself, and I guess maybe why uh, why um, we can push for for kind of debt justice in that space, but maybe some of those kind of bigger conversations about uh, debt cancellation are happening in other spaces at the G20 and the IMF. Um, and then also one just around, um, thank you, <laughs> one just around um, the, uh, what people can do, I guess, from, uh, as as maybe kind of customers of banks or um, of, uh, you know, financial organisation, people with pensions here in the UK, and can we use some of that power to really push for action on the climate? Um, and I maybe gonna then come to you first for that test and then um and then uh yeah I, I can say a tiny bit on that as well and then we'll maybe round off yeah sure in terms of um COP27 and debt cancellation so we absolutely can raise the need for debt cancellation at COP and we will absolutely be doing that but the in terms of where we can achieve debt cancellation, that sits with the G20, the IMF, World Bank, et cetera. So the people and powers attending COP don't have the, the kind of power to put in place debt cancellation, but it is a key space where we can raise the need for it and increase pressure on the IMF, the G20 and the World Bank to actually sort out debt relief um, and address the very weak systems that they have in place to address the debt crisis right now. In terms of customers, banks and um, customers of banks, etc., there are definitely groups in the UK working on this. And I think, Eva, I might pass to you on that one because I think you know more than me. <laughs> so I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd say I think first thing we, we've been running a campaign that I know lots of people have been involved in targeting BlackRock and the big financial asset manager uh, for several months now as they've been a huge blocker in getting uh, debt cancellation for Zambia. Um, and yeah, I think we probably can't stress enough how much getting movement from those uh, private lenders, uh, from BlackRock, from HSBC, from those organizations is crucial to getting debt cancellation because if, they do, if, they, if they're refusing to budge, then it makes other lenders, so like the IMF and the World Bank or other countries much less likely to budge also. So, I think sort of first thing, if, if people feel like writing to BlackRock and getting involved in that campaign, that would be great. Um, there's also a really great organisation called um, Share Action, who I'd really encourage people to get involved in, particularly around campaigning uh, on pensions. Uh, so um, they, they support uh, people to go raise questions at AGMs or kind of, you know, write to... Um, write to their pension holders and kind of push for them to invest in in ways that are you know much less harmful across a range of issues including including a bit of work on debt and also maybe I'd check out kind of uh, positive money um who are who are um another another really good organization working on um a range of issues around some of that that sort of 
um, monetary and financial system, and they're particularly looking for um, they're particularly looking to, I guess, push at the moment central banks to to kind of be greener and be part of that just transition. So uh, I think yeah, there's lot, lots of different ways that you can get involved, but yeah, kind of skilling ourselves up and understanding how to push for change in that financial system is is really crucial. I think. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was a it was a slight that was a slight tangent uh, for me. Sorry. OK, <laughs> I think I'll maybe just we've just got kind of eight or so minutes left. Um, so I'll maybe just hand back to each of our speakers, just if you've got a final words, maybe just literally a couple of, you know, what's the key message that you want to want to leave people with? Um, and I'll say mine is join us on the 12th and solidarity with Farouk and with all the campaigns happening around the world. Um, and, you know, join us to march in London and across the UK. And I will hand over, first of all, um, to Tess. Uh, for a for a final word I haven't thought of it yet um my final word is that there's a lot of power behind um the efforts to address the debt and climate crisis it's it feels like there's a lot of work going on at the moment and that's really exciting I think also the other message is really that this is not just a technical financial issue this is an issue that's affecting people's lives um, right now and it's an urgent issue that we can all get involved in doing something around and I think the mobilization on the 12th is a perfect way to get involved so I really encourage everyone to engage with that. Amazing thank you and I'll pass to Farouk next please. Yes I, I would say that the issue of debt and climate is a political issue and we have to see the politics behind it and we have to really confront that politics of the rich against uh, the, uh, the the poor. And also I would say that uh, for the first time I hear that the campaigns we had been launching in the past has has come up on the top as well. So they are they are they are using our terminologies now, which uh, they never used earlier, climate justice or debt trap and so on. So it's it's a it's it is some success of our campaigns, whatever we do, whatever little or more we do, it has an impact. And that's what we have seen in Pakistan as well. And uh, I uh, I receive normally some messages from Pakistan People's Party, which is party of the Bhutto. Uh, and they are asking our opinion on this issue or that issue, including the son of Benazir Bhutto, who is foreign minister. So we have been listened for the first time. Uh, and some progress has been made, but we need to raise more noise, more voices, and more solidarity among ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tatiana, if you'd like the final word. Thank you so much. And yeah, I am living very inspired by this event. Um, I guess, you know, just a reminder that um, that you know right wing big polluters rich countries are going to you know really try and get us to fight with each other uh, especially as like all these crises you know start to come together like here in the uk uh with the cost of living crisis they will try and um and pit us against each other and especially now against our, you know, friends, family, uh, comrades in the global south. And I guess, you know, um, a reminder that for all of us that um, that climate justice is or goes hand in hand, as you know, you two had said, have said, uh, with debt justice, with economic justice, with racial justice, with gender justice, and that together, um, you know, we can, you know, build our collective power to really, really think about um, the kinds of system that we need, but really to force um, the changes that we need to see and the shift in power that we need to see. So I really hope to see all of us, you know, connecting struggles everywhere and never forgetting uh, that internationalism also needs to be at the forefront of, uh, of everything that we do. So, yeah, thank you so much for coming to the event today. That's brilliant. Thank you. That's a great note to end on. So internationalism and solidarity, I think, going forward. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much to our speakers. I think we're going to close it there.
Um, thank you so much to everyone who, who asked questions or participated as well. Um, and as I said, we'll put the uh, recording up online. So if um, you can hear it all again, uh, if you like. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, thank you so much to everyone. And uh, we'll see some of you hopefully on the 12th. But yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, 